Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's session, Perspectives on Neuropsychiatric Disorders. It is my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Tiago Mayo. Dr. Mayo is an Associate Professor at the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Lisbon, a researcher at the Institute for Molecular Medicine in Lisbon, and a member of the Coordinating Council of the Mind Brain College of the University of Lisbon. For a complete biography on our speaker, please visit the biography tab at the top of the screen. Dr. Maya's talk today will be using computational psychiatry to develop a rigorous and integrative understanding of psychiatric disorders. My name is Dr. Roshan Akashimu, Chair of Neuroscience 2019, and I will be your moderator for this talk. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting questions during the presentation. Simply click on the Ask a Question box located at the far left of your screen and type your questions into the drop-down box. Our speaker will respond to your questions following the presentation. The presentation is educational and thus offers free continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab at the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the um, process to obtain your credits. Now, without any further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Tiago Maya. Dr. Maya? Thank you, Ro. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, so I'm really excited to, to be able to uh, talk to you today about this idea of using computational psychiatry to develop rigorous and integrative understanding of psychiatric disorders. So I, I structured my talk in the first uh, three or four slides. I'm just going to give you a very, very big picture of uh, why uh, we think computational psychiatry is a good idea and why it's important to develop this rigorous and integrative understanding and why we need uh, that integrative kind of approach. Uh, and then I, I'll illustrate that with a specific application, in this case, to Tourette syndrome, in which I think we've been able to develop a fairly uh, comprehensive understanding of a lot of things that are going on in Tourette syndrome uh, by using these computational models as a theoretical framework. So I'll start in a lighter way, and then we'll, we'll move on to the specifics. And I always like to, to start with uh, this quote of, from Henri Poincaré, who was a famous mathematician and philosopher of science, uh, French mathematician and philosopher of science. And he said, science is built up of facts as a house is built up of stones. But an accumulation of facts is no more a science than a heap of stones is a house. And I, I always like to show this because I think it's something that we really need to pay attention to. Uh, very often I feel that we're accumulating more and more facts and not, uh, there is not as much of a house building as I think there should be, not as much as trying to put all of those together uh, in a way that uh, makes sense in a, in a cohesive form. And so when I look at science, I often look at this kind of house as opposed to a well-structured house. So this is, uh, you can tell some things here that uh, are, you can tell there's some trees out there. You can tell there's maybe, uh, you tell bits and pieces, some of them in some parts of the story uh, seem to cohere together, but then a lot of the things really are not related. They're bits and pieces. And I, a lot of my focus in the last couple of years has been trying to see, can we move beyond these bits and pieces to move into these integrative uh, accounts? And part of the problem, so, so I like to show this, uh, this slide, uh, which is from Leonardo da Vinci, as you probably know. And it, it, it's very interesting because he's studying the, the proportions, the mathematical proportions between different things, the length of the arms is equal to the heights, and then this is one tenth of that, and so on. And so he's trying to look at all of these proportions in the human body. And uh, what we do in science is actually we take something and we split it into many, many different little pieces. And so we end up studying these little pieces very often, and then we lose the perspective of the, the global thing. And so what I've been trying to do is, can we put together the pieces again so that we can actually see the whole, and can we make an integrated story uh, from the whole? And of course, uh, you don't necessarily need a, a computational approach to this. So if you saw the previous talk by Tony Grace, it's a very, very nice example of how he has been able to provide the very cohesive account of a very large number of things without the, the computational and mathematical approach. But uh, I like to add the mathematics to it just because, like Galileo said, philosophy, or in this case, philosophy at the time meant nature, is written in that great book, which is ever before our eyes. I mean, the universe, but we cannot understand it if we do, do not first learn the language in which it is written. The book is written in mathematical language, without which one wonders in vain through a dark labyrinth. 
And so the idea here is, uh, can we bring mathematics to bear on problems in psychiatry to avoid wandering in vain through this dark labyrinth uh, that uh, has led us to uh, not make as much progress as we would have liked, given the resources that we've allocated to the problem. And so uh, computational psychiatry, when I say computational, really, I mean mathematical. And it's computational rather than just mathematical, because usually the mathematics that we use are not solved in closed form solutions. And so you need simulations, and that's where the computational comes along. But it's essentially the, the same thing. And there's two types of uh, big approaches to computational psychiatry that are somewhat distinct or fairly distinct in principle. One is you can use computational psychiatry to do fancy uh, data analysis, so machine learning. I call this like statistics 2.0. Uh, and this is data-driven with big data typically. It's largely a-theoretical. Often you completely ignore uh, even any hypothesis or anything like that, and you, you just deriving uh, patterns out of the data. And uh, it, it's promising. It has uh, started to yield very interesting results. Uh, I, I, I like it, but I tend to feel that it, it throws away the baby with the bathwater in the sense that we've been studying mechanisms and so on for uh, so many decades now. And then often this just completely ignores all of that and just goes from the data. And so the other phase of computational psychiatry that I will be focusing on today is using these computational models to develop theories of what is actually going on. And this is sort of the standard in physics. It was the standard since the beginning of physics. So Newton uh, started by developing calculus to account for at the same time that he was developing uh, physics. And two things were always very intertwined in biology, more generally in psychiatry in particular, that has not been the case. But I think the time is ripe. To, uh, we're just a couple of years late, but the time is ripe to, to, to bring those things together. There's also the possibility of combining these two approaches, the theory development and the uh, machine learning. And this has certain advantages that I'll be happy to discuss if you want to ask me questions about that. But for today, I really just want to focus on the theory development part of the story. So that was sort of my very uh, broad uh, introduction to why computational psychiatry, why now, why, why do we want to be doing this? Of course, it probably sounds a little vague, and it was a little vague, and, and we need to put some meat onto these bones. And so we'll do that by trying to see if we can use this uh, to start to make sense of what is going on in a given disorder, in this case, in Tourette syndrome, and particularly the role of dopamine in Tourette syndrome. So Tourette syndrome, as you probably know, is a disorder characterized mostly by uh, Ticks, so this can be motor or vocal, so these are repetitive movements such as a repetitive eye blinking or shoulder shrugging or coughing or <clears throat> clearing your throat. And this is the visible side of the disorder and it's the sort of diagnostic side of the disorder. But most patients also report that they have premonitory urges and these are things that uh, they, uh, these are feelings that they have that uncomfortable sensations that sort of compel them to do the ticks because the ticks alleviate those premonitory urges. And so patients with Tourette's will often tell you that they're doing that tick. No, it's not really an involuntary action as used to be thought, but it's a semi-voluntary. So they would rather not do the tick, but they have the premonitory urge. And so they have the feeling that they have to do the tick to alleviate that very disturbing urge. And I'll be addressing both phases of, of um, Dressing, I'll start with the motor component, and then I'll address the premonitory urges later on in the talk. And so what we know about dopaminergic disturbances in, in Tourette's, and I, I'll be covering a lot of ground, so for each section I'll give you a little bit of uh, a summary to, to capture what goes on in that section. And the summary here is that my interpretation of the data is that Tourette's syndrome probably involves dopaminergic hyperinnervation. That is, too many dopamine terminals, uh, particularly in the striatum. And so what, what's the evidence for that? This is from a table from, from a review that we just published last year in, in which we reviewed the uh, PET and SPEC studies of the dopamine system in Tourette's. And uh, we have here the several markers of the dopamine system. On the left are the ones that have been uh, studied. And then each little box is a study. And green studies means that it was shown, and those studies showed an increase in Tourette's relative to controls. Uh, and yellow studies showed no difference. And the single red study showed an increase in controls relative to Tourette's, and it's sort of an outlier here. 
And so if you, if you just uh, eyeball this table, you see that there's about as much green as there is yellow. So there's about a, as many positive studies as there are null studies. Now, the thing with this is that this should not be taken as symmetric it, because the, the, way, the, the evidence to reach a significant result is it's much harder to reach a significant result than to reach a null result, especially with the really, really tiny samples that have been used in most of these studies. So many of these studies have had around 10 subjects. So a null result with 10 subjects can very well just be an underpowered uh, study, and most likely it is because these studies really were all very small. Not only were they small, they often had uh, nasty confounds. A typical one is uh, there's more patients uh, more male patients than in the control group, uh, so more males in the patients than in the control group because Tourette's tends to occur more in males. And why is that a problem? Because we know that, for example, females actually have a higher um, higher DAP densities, higher densities of the dopamine transport. So if you're putting more females in the control group and you don't find a difference, it might just be because there's more females in the control group, and that might be sort of washing out the fact that you would otherwise see. And so overall, although the evidence, actually the quality of the evidence is extremely poor, the studies are very small, uh, uh, the, so there's lots of confounds and the quality of the evidence is extremely poor, and, but it is what it is. And insofar as we can take this evidence, and I, I really would urge uh, you know, funding agencies and so on to fund more of these studies and larger scale studies, because for example, in schizophrenia, the field is so much further ahead in terms of understanding all of these things. There's been so much more investment in, in all of these studies. Uh, and here, the, unfortunately, there isn't. But insofar as what we can tell, and based on this idea that it's harder to get a positive result than a null result, it seems that the evidence would suggest that there is indeed an increase in these dopamine markers, these various dopamine markers in Tourette's, uh, and then the, that ties well with the effects of medication and so on, as we'll see uh, further in a little bit. And then the question is, well, okay, so how, how do you interpret this? And there's uh, typically what happens is that people, uh, for example, there's a very nice review of the dopamine disturbances in threats, and it says that there are four main hypotheses, but often each hypothesis is like, it refers to just a single set of studies. And so people find something else and they say, okay, so this is a new hypothesis. And again, I like to think of the integrative approach. How, how can you explain everything as simply as possible? Of course, no, sim no simpler, but as simply as possible. And if uh, you think about all of those findings, they all can emerge out of the simple fact that if there is too much dopamine innervation, there is too many dopamine terminals, then you would actually see all of those findings. You would see an increase in the dopamine transporter because there's more terminals there. You'd see an increase in synthesis. Again, there's more terminals there. You'd see an increase in the vesicular monoamine transporter too. I'll show you what this is in a moment, but this is something that is also in the presynaptic terminals. And of course, you would see an increase in amphetamine-induced dopamine release, which is another finding in Tourette's. And so the dopamine hyperinnervation would give you an explanation for all of those findings, all of the molecular imaging findings. And then as we'll see, it also interacts with a lot of other findings as well. So this is where the integrative idea comes in. And so uh, just to, to get a, a an idea of this, I, I'm schematically showing here three dopamine terminals, and uh, here that they all look the same. And there is the dopamine transporter is present in the terminal. There's dopamine release by the terminal. The VMAT2 is a transporter that puts uh, dopamine into the vesicles. And then uh, you also have the synthesis. And so these are the four things that are being measured in the PET and SPECT studies. And if you have more dopamine terminals, then you're going to have more of all of these things. Of course, when we're doing pet inspect, we don't know, we, we measure things at a very, very gross level. And so there's alternative interpretations. Um, I, I won't belabor those other than, uh, I'll mention one that is uh, more popular, but you could think that there's other things going on. Uh, and one hypothesis that has been uh, quite uh, popular is that instead of the dopamine transport, which is really the, the most commonly replicated study, because also it's where there's more studies uh, to a large extent, uh, instead of the increase in dopamine transport, they're meaning that there's more terminals, it might mean that there's more dopamine transporter per terminal. 
So if that was the case, uh, the idea and the story is that there's a decrease then in extracellular, that causes a decrease in extracellular dopamine. And you could imagine that there would be, uh, that, that would lead to some of the other findings. I, I won't belabor the details of that, uh, not, but although this is published, you can, you can look at the details. But it wouldn't explain the increase in the VMAT too, but there's a bigger problem with this idea. And then I, I'll mention this uh, in, in uh, a slide or two. You could still think that it would be the increased synthesis that would be problematic. Again, that would explain perhaps some of the other findings, but not all of them. But um, the, the hypothesis of the increased dopamine hyperinnervation really ends up being the most parsimonious because it explains all of this and it will really explain a lot of other findings. So, so uh, if uh, Tourette's does involve dopamine hyperinnervation, then this would lead, of course, to hyperdopaminergia, to too much dopamine, and you would have, in principle, both too much tonic dopamine, and this is the dopamine that's hanging around there. If you, if you saw uh, Tony Grace's talk, you, you know this very well. He has worked a lot on this idea of tonic and phasic dopamine, and also more phasic dopamine, which is the dopamine that uh, is released relevant in relation to stimuli, and that occurs, the, the firing of dopamine neurons here occurs in the hundreds of milliseconds, as, whereas the tonic dopamine is something that is much more stable over time. Now, if that's the case, if indeed Tourette's involves dopamine hyperinnervation, medication should decrease, in, if that leads to increased tonic and phasic dopamine, then medications should decrease tonic and or phasic uh, dopamine transmission to be effective, and indeed, I, I'll show you that that's exactly what they do. Uh, they, they decrease one or the other or both. And then, uh, and this is what I will use computational uh, methods to then argue, the increased phasic dopamine is, this is the hypothesis, increased phasic dopamine is going to promote the learning of ticks, whereas the increased tonic dopamine is going to promote the expression of ticks. And do, I'll get into this distinction a little bit. So the idea that ticks are learned behaviors, in particular, I'm going to argue that they're learned motor habits. They're learned abnormally because of the increased dopamine that's and the increased phasic firing of dopamine. And then the tonic dopamine is going to increase both your general motor activity and the expression of these learned behaviors. And we'll see that in more detail uh, further along. Now, uh, I wanted to mention in more detail one of the prior hypotheses, just to explain why it's not why that perceived wisdom is not so wise. And the, this prior hypothesis was based on the idea that the increased that the increased dopamine transporter that you see in PET actually means too much dopamine per terminal. And if it means too much dopamine per terminal, then uh, dopamine is going then that is going to reuptake too much dopamine, that will lead to low tonic dopamine, as opposed to high, as I'm suggesting, and that would lead to to low tonic dopamine. And then because you didn't have as much tonic dopamine, the outer receptors for dopamine would be less, um, less occupied, and so that would lead to an increase in phasic. So the traditional idea, if you look up tonic phasic hypothesis of stress, the traditional idea is that tonic dopamine is decreased and phasic increased, rather than both being increased, and, as I'm suggesting. And I, I wanted to deconstruct a little bit that idea uh, to, to explain why I think that's, that's uh, unlikely. And so, again, the received wisdom is that Tourette's involves uh, decreased tonic dopamine. So, what are the problems? As I said, this is based on the idea that there is too much dopamine per too much that per terminal, and so there's too much reuptake. Well, if that was the case, then how do you best treat Tourette's? Well, of course, you just block the dopamine transport. If the problem is that there's too much of it, you just block it, and that's what stimulants do. But, of course, stimulants are not a first line of treatment for Tourette's. In fact, there's been a long discussion about whether they uh, make it worse uh, rather than better. Uh, and. There's several meta-analyses. The story is quite complicated, but for sure, it's not an effective treatment for Tourette's. You don't go to the to your doctor, say I have Tourette's, and then they give you a stimulant to treat Tourette's for sure. And so that already should suggest that that's not a good idea. Uh, 
And another problem with that idea is that it was based on early findings that haloperidol actually increased uh, homovanillic acid, which is dopamine metabolite, in cerebrospinal fluid. And so, and this was occurring at the same time as it was improving threats. And so, people were interpreting this to mean that haloperidol, instead of uh, actually blocking dopamine transmission, which is what it really does, uh, that this was somehow increasing dopamine. The problem with that is that there's lots of uh, evidence that haloperidol actually decreases tonic dopamine in the striatum. It does not increase. And there's other medications such as uh, amphetamine in which the effect that you see in the striatum is the opposite of the effect that you see in CSF. So really, the CSF is not a good measure. Dopamine in CSF really is not a good measure of uh, dopamine in the striatum. And Yet another problem with the idea that TS involves uh, low tonic dopamine as opposed to high tonic dopamine is that D2 receptors, which is where all of the antipsychotics, which are one of the main treatments for Tourette's act, D2 receptors are more sensitive to tonic dopamine as opposed to physic dopamine, or the, they're particularly sensitive to, so they're, sorry, they're sensitive to both, but because they have their high affinity they actually, if you block D2 receptors, they, they were sensitive to tonic dopamine and you'd be decreasing the effect of tonic dopamine. Well, that would be a terrible idea if TS already involved a reduction in tonic dopamine to be blocking those receptors that are already sensitive to tonic dopamine, you'd just be making the problem worse. If that was the case, then you should only be able to treat TS by using something like a, a copy pump, which blocks the D1 receptor, which has lower sensitivity to dopamine, uh, lower affinity to dopamine, and therefore is mostly activated by the phase. So for these reasons, and in fact other reasons, uh, I, I don't think the idea that TS involves low tonic dopamine is, is tenable. Uh, in fact, this idea of the, the reverse relation between tonic and phasic dopamine, low tonic and high phasic, was uh, originally uh, sort of suggested by Tony Grace, the, the previous speaker, for schizophrenia, and then it was adapted uh, for, for threats. But if you heard uh, Tony's prior talk, you also know that, in fact, now he's suggesting that the more ton neurons are fine, tonic fine, the more they can fire physically. And so, in fact, the relation, if anything, might be positive the, between the tonic and the physic fine. Okay. So... So that part was to try to see what we know about the molecular uh, imaging of dopamine system in Tourette's, and we came to the conclusion that it seems that it suggests that there's increased uh, innervation, uh, increased dopaminergic innervation in the strat. Now, how, how does that relate to the pharmacology of Tourette's? Well, it turns out that all medications used to treat Tourette's actually reduced uh, dopamine transmission. And so this slide here, it's a little bit busy, but it shows all of the main medications that are uh, used to treat Tourette's. And it shows that they actually all reduce dopamine transmission in one way or another. So uh, in, in the interest of time, and because this is published, I, I won't go through every single little step here, uh, but I, I will highlight a couple that are perhaps a little bit less intuitive and that uh, so the very, very typical one and the intuitive one is here in A, the D2 antagonists, most antipsychotics do that. They are blocking the postsynaptic D2 receptors, also the presynaptic, but they, at the, those that they use, they, they block a lot the postsynaptic receptors, and that's reducing the transmission of dopamine. So that's a, a very, very uh, intuitive case. Now, a less intuitive case uh, and more interesting and also uh, a, shows how much you need to look into the details, is the case of low dose of dopamine agonists. So dopamine agonists at low doses actually improve Tourette's. And so you might think that this is uh, counter to having too much dopamine. Why would you give a dopamine agonist and it would work? Well, because at low doses, dopamine agonists actually work mostly on presynaptic receptors, autoreceptors, and thereby inhibit the release of dopamine. So in case B here, low dose of pergolin has been shown to improve Tourette's. And the way it does that is it acts 
more on the, at this low dose, it acts more on the presynaptic, at the presynaptic level. And again, that then has a series of mechanisms that will lead to a reduction in the re release of dopamine, in addition to in the synthesis of dopamine, the firing of the neurons, and even it upgrade it upregulates the dopamine transporter itself. Now, it's quite interesting the story of the dopamine agonist, the low dose dopamine agonist, because then people said, okay, let's try another one, and especially because pergolin has some some uh, worrisome side effects. Uh, and, and they tried uh, here, if you look in C, they tried low dose of pramipexol, and it actually did not work. And so uh, people sort of abandoned this, but I, I think they did so uh, erroneously, because if you look at the details uh, with chronic use, low doses of uh, Pramipexol stop having much of an effect on the D2 autoreceptor, which is the one that helps to downregulate all of the dopamine activity. And they have, they continue to have an effect on the D3 autoreceptor, which does not do that. In fact, it seems to do the opposite. And so uh, we have uh, suggestions about which, uh, which other dopamine agonists should be uh, tried. Uh, that have a better profile here uh, in terms of their action on the D2S versus the D3 autoreceptor. And uh, I think it's a good example of we really need to look at the details and try to understand why one thing works and another one doesn't to then be able to make progress. Um, so the, other, the only other thing that I wanted to say so as not to spend too much time on this slide Oh, oh, just still on that case, uh, it should not be surprising that low dose primipexol does not help with threats because if you, in fact, it's a treatment for Parkinson's, low dose primipexol uh, is a treatment for Parkinson's disease. And so that just goes to show that it should, if anything, be having an effect, you know, to increasing uh, dopamine, which is not what you would want for threats. Low dose pergolid is not a treatment for Parkinson's. In fact, it makes Parkinson's worse. And so this is still all very consistent with the idea that there's too much dopamine in threats. So just before, before leaving this slide, I wanted to mention here uh, the mechanism here, E, which is in the US in particular, North America, uh, the first line of treatment for threats typically is alpha-2 and alpha-2A agonists. Uh, it's not because they have a bigger effect size, it's because because they don't, antipsychotics have a bigger one, but it's because they, their side effect profile is more beneficial. Uh, but as it turns out, alpha-2, or alpha-2 in particular agonists, decrease dopamine release as well. And so, again, this is actually related to, and can be related to, to the dopamine account. Okay, so so there was so we saw first the part of the molecular imaging studies, the hyper innovation that explained a lot of the well, all of the findings, and then it also explains why all of the medications that are used to treat threats reduce dopamine transmission. Now, uh, what do we know about the pathophysiology of threats, and uh, here what we know is that threats involves disturbances in the motor loop through the basal ganglia. Not only in the motor loop, there's also a, a a big involvement of sensory areas, and that will come up for premonitory edges later in the talk. But for now, I'm, I'm focusing on, on the motor part. So, and certainly the motor loop uh, has been very, very strong. Okay. So this is just from a, a review that we published uh, no, two years ago now. Uh, and what this shows is it shows in, in here we're showing structural abnormalities in uh, Tourette syndrome and on Sort of the right of the plot, you have the motor loop. So you have the motor, cortical motor areas, M1, supplementary motor area, singlet motor area. And then you have the loop through the basal ganglia, the putamen, globus pallidus, and thalamus. Uh, here uh, you have the dopamine regions on the lower left, uh, the VTA and the SNC. And then on the top left, you have uh, somatosensory regions and the insula which are also involved. And so the way this is color coded is that if it's green, it means that there's a reduction in cortical thickness. And if you notice, there's basically all of, almost all of these regions that I mentioned have reduced cortical thickness in, in patients with TS and reduced structural connectivity uh, between cortical regions and the striatum. Those are the 
green arrows. And then subcortically, actually, you see the opposite effect. The, the yellows mean an increase, and you actually have an opposite effect. You have an increase in volumes in the putamen, in the thalamus, and also in regions consistent with the dopaminergic regions. And so uh, the reason for, for this discrepancy, the thinning in one case and the thick thickness or thickening in the, uh, in the thinning in the cortical and the th thickening, thickening in the subcortical uh, is, is interesting and, and there, there's details about that. But for now, suffice it to say that all of these regions uh, are, are involved and th these are the regions from the moral to the basal gang, in addition to the somatosensory regions. Functional studies show exactly the same thing. So this is just showing that all of those regions are hyperactive in Tourette's or they're hyperactive at rest or they're uh, active before patients tick and in a way that's related to ticks and so on. So really this structure is very, very, this loop is well known to be involved. And this is just from a study, an example from a study that I was involved in a few years back when I was still a postdoc. Uh, at Columbia in the in the lab of Brad Peterson, and uh, where we also showed uh, hyperactivity in the motor loop in TS in all of those regions that I was mentioning: the supplementary motor area, primary motor cortex, putamen, thalamus, and so on. We also looked at the functional connectivity between regions in the motor loop in Tourette's and this is a very busy slide because the arrows represent all the connections between those regions, but the, the arrows in orange represent an increase in functional connectivity. And I wanted to highlight here the dopamine, uh, the increase in functional connectivity from dopamine regions to the striatum as one of the things that we found, which is quite interesting and again, consistent with that idea of the hyper innervation of the striatum by dopamine terminals. Okay, so, so we now know that the motor loop is involved in Tourette's, but what does it do? Uh, and why would it be involved in Tourette's? Well, to some extent, you would expect it to be involved in Tourette's because it's a motor disorder and this is a, these are motor structures. So to some extent, it's perhaps a little bit of a no-brainer, but it, it's not so much because uh, it's interesting that the whole loop, including the basal ganglia circuitry is involved and then I'm now, when I moved to the pathophysiology, I sort of talked a little bit about dopamine, but I didn't talk about how it ties with everything else. And now we'll see how it ties, how these things that um, these pathophysiological findings tie back to the idea of the hyper innervation. And so that comes because the motor loop is involved in learning and executing motor habits, and the way it learns them, uh, the way it learns them is through dopamine. And so if there's too much dopamine, you, this will lead to too much habit learning and the ticks will be this aberrant, exaggerated more habits. And then if you have too much uh, dopamine, that will also lead to too much habit execution. And then that part I will explain with the computational model. So I, on purpose, I, I left the computational part till the end because the emphasis is, is on building an integrative approach. And, uh, the computational part is to the extent that it helps to do that. And as we'll see, it will be very helpful for that. Okay, so, so there's a lot of evidence that the motor loop is involved in habit learning and execution. I'll, I'll just mention one of our own studies uh, for illust illustrative purposes, but there's certainly many other studies about this. And here we, we conducted a study in which uh, people had to learn a habit uh, and learning a habit, a habit is a Stimulus response association. So it's something that you, it's a response that you perform in a given situation automatically, no longer because you're uh, wanting a certain goal. And you can model this using a thing called Q learning, which in essence, you can think of these Q values that this comes from the machine learning literature as the strength of the association between the stimulus S and the response R, or because in um, machine learning people usually use A for action. QSA is like the strength of the association between a stimulus and the response, like SR from the Thorndike classical ideas about stimulus response learning. And so what we found is that 
uh, we looked at the areas whose activity correlated with the strength of the habit. And to infer the strength of the habit in the person's brain, we used a thing called model by fMRI, which makes use of the computational models. And that's where things start to, to get uh, computational. Uh, and we looked at, because of course, the strength of a habit is something that you have to infer from behavior. You cannot directly measure from behavior. Then you can look at the neural correlates of that inferred strength. That's what we do here. And so we found that in, in the posterior lateral putamen and also in the ventral striatum, we found a correlation with the strength of the habit. But we think the action is really in the posterior lateral putamen and not in the ventral striatum because we had people who in this study who were able to learn the habit and others who were not able to learn the habit. And what distinguished them was that the people who learned the habit actually engaged that region of the posterior lateral putamen. And the putamen, uh, I should note, is a region that has been very involved in Tourette's. And so this is where you're starting to learn more habits, and this is where um, then the tics would be learned. Now, what does this have to do with dopamine? Well, what it has to do with dopamine is that the habits are learned based on the, firing of, the phasic firing of dopamine nerves. So this is a long-standing uh, idea from computational models. So if you have your sensory cortices representing the state or situation, that would be your S, and then in the putamen, you would have your actions, your potential actions, action one, action two, series of actions. And of course, the putamen receives very strong uh, innervation from dopamine. Now, if you're in a given state, let's say state one, you perform a given action, let's say action one. Oh, and uh, just before I say that, so, so the idea is going to be, so we know from the work of Wolfram Schultz that dopamine neurons represent a thing called a prediction error. And the idea then is that we found in the putamen these Q values, so they're not really the actions themselves, but the value of that action, which in turn can be interpreted as the strength of the association from the stimulus to the action. So, and we know from the machine learning literature that the way you learn these Q values is by using the prediction error. So a Q value without getting into the technical details, a Q value is learned through this prediction error, which is signaled by dopamine. So it makes a lot of sense that you have Q values in the putamen, and you have prediction errors signaled by dopamine, and that dopamine projects strongly to the putamen, because that's where you, you want to be using it to learn the Q values. And so uh, that part makes a lot of sense. And so, so what's the idea? The idea is, again, let's say you're in state one, you perform action one, and then that leads to something good. Uh, in general, this would be if it leads to something good, then you will get a firing of your dopamine neurons. And because of that firing, through, there will have an effect on corticostriatal plasticity there that will strengthen the association between that state and that action. And so now next time you'll be more likely to perform again uh, that action when you're in that state. Notice though that if the dopamine neurons fired when they shouldn't have fired, whatever action you were performing actually got strengthened. Uh, and so if this was some tick, uh, you were performing some action that you had this big burst in dopamine neuron, that in dopamine neuron firing that you shouldn't have gotten or this big dopamine release in the striatum, and you just strengthened something that you should not have strengthened. And that would be the mechanism then for tick learning. Now, um, if this is indeed true, if there is this change in functional connectivity, we should be able to see a change in functional connectivity between sensory regions and the putamen as people learn the habit. And indeed, we did find that. We, did, we found this is a, a somewhat busy slide, but it shows an increase in yellow. You see the increase in functional connectivity between those regions and the putamen in proportion to that Q value, in proportion to the strength of the habit. And what you see is that those sensory and motor regions are actually increasing their connectivity to the putamen as people learn the habit, just as has been long hypothesized by computational models. And this actually occurred in people who learned the habit, but not in people who did not learn the habit. Now, it's very interesting that we also found a set of regions that were disconnecting from that. And there's a, a very, very interesting uh, 
strategy for them, why you're getting that and how it's consistent with uh, a set of things. But um, I, I, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll gloss over that for now. Okay, so, so what have we just seen? Well, we saw from the pathophysiology section that the motor loop is involved in TS, in Tourette's. We just saw now that those same regions, in particular centered in the striatum and putamen, are involved in habits. And so this leads me to the hypothesis that ticks may be exaggerated maladaptive motor habits. But okay, wh why are they there? And then this is where the dopamine account uh, comes in, because habit learning and execution are modulated by dopamine. I already started to mention that. I'll mention it in more detail computationally next. And if that's the case, then the hyperdopaminergia in TS might be what underlies the successive habit learning and execution that produces ticks and in turn produces those structural abnormalities in those regions of the motor loop and so on that we discussed. Okay, so, so let's talk a little bit in more detail about the computational roles of dopamine uh, first in general, because you always need to have a model of function before you have a model of dysfunction, and then uh, the, the implications for threats. And, as I mentioned before, the idea is that increased phasic dopamine, because of the dopamine hyperinnervation, promotes tick learning, whereas increased tonic dopamine, also because of dopamine hyperinnervation, promotes tick execution. And this distinction between learning and execution will actually have implications, for example, for treatment. Uh, because you might be, as a preview, you might be modulating the execution of ticks, inhibiting the execution of ticks, but not really causing their unlearning, which is what you really want. So this is a very important distinction. So dopamine has sort of two basic roles, and uh, to, in a simplistic, somewhat simplistic way, but uh, reasonably accurate, phasic dopamine is used for reinforcement learning, for learning things, and we saw how. And tonic dopamine is used for invigorating action or causing you to perform more actions uh, especially per unit time, and especially amplifying learned actions. And this is why increased tonic dopamine would lead to more, more ticks, more tick expression. I, I'll gloss over this because it's getting into the details of the computation, and I, then I, I won't have time to get into a lot of details. But uh, let me just jump right into this to say that so. Previously, I talked about the strengthening of the corticostriatal synapses from cortex to the striatum as a mechanism for learning. But it turns out and that you would strengthen those when you had a positive prediction, and that's how you would learn the habit. But as it turns out, in the brain, things are a little bit more complicated. Because instead of having just one system to learn these stimulus response associations, you have two opponent systems. And uh, this is, has been very nicely uh, this idea has been very nicely developed by Michael Frank and uh, more, uh, a little bit more recently with Anne Collins that they've um, laid out this in a very, very nice, uh, coherent way. And the idea is that, but this also goes back many, many years, the idea of the direct versus indirect pathway as these opponent pathways through the basal ganglia. And so the opponent actors are the direct pathway, which is represented here in green on the left, and the indirect pathway which is represented in red on the right. And uh, Michael and I and others like to call the direct pathway the go pathway, and G represents go, and the indirect pathway the no go, because the direct pathway is going to facilitate action execution, so it's go, and the indirect is going to inhibit action execution, it's no go. And, and really, the tendency to perform an action is going to result from a subtraction of the two pathways. Uh, but so the idea then is how, how does phasic dopamine lead to learning? Well, so if you have uh, the idea is that it affects differentially plasticity in the two pathways. And so if you have a burst in dopamine, notice oh, you can characterize this mathematically, but uh, if you have a burst in dopamine, notice what happens. What happens is that the go pathway on the left is getting thicker because that's how you because of the effect on D1 receptors, you're strengthening that association. And the effect on the right pathway, if anything, is actually getting 
weaker. And so here you'll have more go for that action. You just learn to perform that action and you're going to have a great tendency to perform. Now, what about tonic dopamine? Tonic dopamine has an effect then during choice. Um, just see how I'm doing for time here. Um, so tonic dopamine has an effect during choice and this effect it should be distinguished from the effect on learning. And the effect during choice, this is a fairly busy slide, but the idea is that dopamine is going to modulate the excitability of go and no go uh, medium spiny neurons in the striatum differentially. And uh, in my view, because tonic dopamine is going to affect mostly the indirect pathway, the no go pathway, because D2 receptors have higher affinity. And so for the low levels of tonic dopamine that are present, the D2 receptor is going to be the, the one that's mostly affected. The D1 uh, will go, is going to be less affected. And as I said, in the end, really, the tendency to perform the action is going to be the subtraction uh, of these two tendencies. And then you can normalize this in terms of what happens to other actions. But so, the idea then is if you have more dopamine, and, and I'll, I'll run this, vid, this little animation again, if you have more dopamine, notice what happens. What happens is that the more dopamine is going to inhibit the no-go pathway, inhibiting the no-go neurons, and so you're going to have much less of the no-go. If you have more go and less no-go, you're going to have more tendency to perform the actions, in particular the actions for which you have learned the habit of performing them, that is to say, the actions in which those synapses, the corticostriatal synapses, are strong. And so I know that this is a little fast, it's just to give you a general idea that these ideas are, are also published, that uh, you can look up the references there. Uh, but so the idea then is that the tonic dopamine will decrease your no go and make you more likely to perform the go, that is to say, to perform the tick. So, uh, based on this idea of the function of the pathways, you, you can actually derive the whole structure of the basal ganglia, why it is the way it is and uh, how it works out. But I, I won't go through that in the interest of time. And I'll also skip this part here. Uh, but so, going back now to the beginning, the idea that TS involves dopamine hyperinversion. Remember, the idea is that we're all deriving we're deriving everything from a very simple principle. Then, if it involves dopamine hyperinnervation, it increases phasic and tonic dopamine, and the phasic dopamine is involved in the tick learning, those bursts, and the tonic dopamine in tick expression and overall motor hyperactivity. So, let, let me now try to just uh, give an illustration for how this would work uh, in, in TS, and I've simplified things greatly here to make it easy. So I'm representing here just a single state or situation. I'm representing the tick and an alternative action, A, and I'm representing the direct pathway in a very simplistic way just by showing the striatum and then the effect that it ultimately has on motor cortex. And this, so that's in green is the direct or go pathway, and in red is the indirect or no go pathway. And what happens is that in unmedicated state in Tourette's, because you have learned, because of those aberrant phasic uh, responses, notice that the synapse from the cortex to the striatum for the tick is already very thick. So you've learned the tick by this mechanism of habit learning due to the abnormal firing of dopamine neurons. Now, in addition to that, notice what happens that the no-go uh, structures are fairly inhibited. The activity there is fairly inhibited why? Because you have a lot of tonic dopamine, and that's hitting the D2 receptors, that's inhibiting the no-go pathway, and so you have a lot of go and very little no-go, and so you have a great tendency to perform the tick here in the motor cortex. The tick is like this big box because you have a big tendency to perform. Now, notice what happens in, when you give a, an antipsychotic acutely. Now, we're going to Consider what happens with an acute antipsychotic dose uh, if it would be one that was already effective. So what that would do is it would, it would block the D2 receptors in the no-go pathway, 
Okay, and by blocking those D2 receptors in the no-go pathway, those neurons, those MSNs are going to be able to be more active. And so they're now more active and they're able to perform then, to then give more no-go to the tick. And because the tendency to perform the tick is always the difference between the go and no-go, that will actually reduce the tendency to perform the tick. Uh, now, of course, it might also reduce the tendency to perform other actions as well, and that would be uh, involved in the, in the side effects. But notice that here with the acute antipsychotic, you're just decreasing the expression of the tick. You didn't affect the learning. You didn't affect the plasticity. To affect the, the learning, to actually have an, an effect on unlearning, you need to affect the plasticity. And indeed, with chronic antipsychotic use, there's evidence that you will affect the plasticity. So with chronic antipsychotics, what you would have then is that you would actually get a strengthening of the corticostriatal synapses uh, for the no-go. And so you're actually now performing unlearning, which on top of the effect on expression will lead to even more no-go for the tick and therefore an even greater ability to inhibit the tick. And so this would be why you'd get a continued improvement in Tourette's with chronic use, uh, as opposed to just uh, acute. Now, it's quite interesting, and uh, I don't have time to get into the details, but uh, the, the dynamics of what happens and when you remove antipsychotics and so on is quite interesting, but often patients won't immediately get back to having the full, um, the full extent of the ticks they had before, but they sort of reacquired them, which is sort of a relearning of the ticks, and that is quite interesting. We, we discussed that in some details um, in, in the papers about this. So I, I have, uh, I don't have a lot of time left because I only leave some time for questions, but I, I did want to now get back to premonitory urges a little bit because for now we've talked a lot about uh, how from dopamine hyperinnervation you get all of the things that come uh, so far, really, and that come until what I've mentioned here. But now, what about the premonitory urges? And really, the premonitory urges are those sensations that the patients have. And a summary of what this section is about, uh, the neural substances of this seems to involve the somatosensory cortices, the insula, which we think is sort of at a point of intersection between the somatosensory and the motor, and perhaps the motor cortices. And how does this relate to dopamine? Well, it relates to dopamine in the sense that when a premonitory urge is an aversive sensation, so it's something that uh, patients don't like. And the idea is that when you terminate something that is bad, that actually elicits a positive prediction error. So mathematically, you go from a state in which something is bad, from a negative state to a state in which is zero, and the prediction error mathematically is the difference between what you got minus what you had before. So if you got something that's neutral, zero, you no longer have a monetary urge, and you had something that was negative before, zero minus a negative number is positive, and you'll get a burst in dopamine neurons, and that would be uh, what would be capable of reinforcing the tick. And so uh, I just um, go quite quickly through this just to say that the somatosensory cortices in insula are involved in Tourette's. I, I had shown this before. Um, they correlate. So the, the structural abnormalities here in these structures in the somatosensory cortex and the insula actually correlates with the severity of premonitory urges. And now to get to the idea of how this works computationally, and then ultimately that explains how the relation to dopamine is that here, if you, exact, as I said, terminating the premonitory urge will lead to a positive prediction error. And what dopamine really, what phasic dopamine represents are positive prediction errors. And so dopamine will, would fire. And so the idea here is that if you're in a state, you on the left on number one, if you're in a state you, which is this urge, the aversive state, you perform the tick, you go to this S or safe state in which uh, it's neutral, it's a zero. So zero minus the negative value of U is a positive prediction error, and that would be what would strengthen the tick. So actions can be strengthened not only by positive things, but also by avoiding or terminating negative things. And this is 
um, just a, a little simulation of how there would occur. Um, and there's a couple of ways computationally that this occurs, but um, I, I want to leave some time for questions. Yeah. So, 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 so just to just to sort of, we can then integrate these ideas with the computational models that I had shown before. We can add this part about the premonitory urges, their negative values, and how that leads to an increase in dopamine. I, I won't have time to go through that, and I, I just want to um, sort of terminate now and say that. This is, a, again, a very busy slide, but the idea here is just to show that we've tried to relate a lot of different things. So dopamine innervation, how its effects on phasic and tonic dopamine, how that uh, relates to habit learning and execution, how habit learning and execution are related to tick learning and execution, uh, the role then on the right, the role of the premonitory urges in then inducing dopamine release and so on. And so really, the ideas that we have, we think, this very, very integrative and cohesive account, which in a sense is going back to the very first uh, slide. It's like building the house, or in this case, it's a, it's a replica of the Parthenon, uh, which I like because the Parthenon has some mathematically interesting qualities to it. So just to terminate, I, I'd like to thank uh, Vashku, who's done a lot of this work uh, with me, uh, Angelo and Katerina, who are also involved in some of the Tourette's work, and Michael, with whom I've discussed a lot of these models over time. And I'll take uh, questions if there's time. Thank you so much for that excellent talk, Dr. Maya. I love the uh, Poincaré quote, um, and I appreciate <laughs> you putting That was great. I appreciate you putting together those bricks that build the uh, cohesive picture for uh, increased dopamine innervation uh, leading to uh, the dysfunction in Tourette syndrome, at least the ticket expression aspect of it. That was very interesting. Thank you. So now you. we have uh, time for uh, a few questions uh, in the live Q&A portion, which we're starting now. And um, if anybody has any questions, please submit them to our speaker uh, by clicking the ask a question box on the far left of your screen. And um, any questions we don't get to now will be answered by our speaker via email. So um, we will go to some questions here. It says, um, can you speak a little more to the role of GABA in Tourette syndrome? Yes, yes, of course. Uh, yes, so, so that's, that's a great question. And, and uh, I, I'm grateful for the question because it allows me to to say that although I focused on dopamine, I'm, I'm not saying that dopamine is the end-all and be-all uh, of everything. And, and so uh, GABA certainly, well, first of all, the, the circuits in the basal ganglia, they're all GABAergic, right? And so GABA clearly has uh, an interesting and important effect there. And second, really what matters to a large extent is this balance between the direct and indirect method. That's, uh, of course, a very old idea, but I think it's still relevant that the balance between the direct and indirect pathways where it all really comes into play. And for example, there's evidence that uh, patients with Tourette's have a reduced number of uh, fast spiking interneurons uh, in the striatum, and these are interneurons that are GABAergic. And uh, how, how does that relate to this whole account? Well, it does because, uh, again, the idea is that the balance between the direct and indirect pathway is what matters. And the fast spiking interneurons seem to actually inhibit the direct pathway more than they inhibit the indirect pathway. And so if you have reduced number of fast spiking interneurons, you would then have sort of a relative disinhibition of the direct pathway, so more go activity relative to no go, which is kind of the same effect that you have with the with the tonic dopamine. And so whatever leads to that kind of imbalance could potentially lead to the same, to the same consequences. Um, I think that's related to another question that we have about uh, dopamine acts differently on D1 versus D2 receptors. Did your model account for this when modeling strengthening cortical butamin, uh, butaminic connectivity during habit formation? Yes, that's exactly right. So, so, so the answer is yes. We, we the the whole well, well, there's there's two answers to that, and it depends on which part of the talk the the question refers to. But in, in the more detailed part of the talk, uh, in computationally more detailed part, that's exactly what it's all about. Is that you have differential effects on plasticity, 
and on excitability on the direct versus indirect pathway, precisely because the direct pathway has D1 receptors and the indirect pathway has D2 receptors and they have opposite effects. And so that's what leads to sort of symmetric effects on plasticity or reverse effects on plasticity in the two pathways and reverse effects on excitability in the two pathways. It's exactly because of that. Uh, so where we did not do that, and that's because we sometimes when you have these very detailed computational models and it's more difficult to fit them to uh, actual empirical data. And so where we did not do that and where we used the simplest thing was in the article in which we showed the strengthening in controls uh, of, uh, we showed the Q values and the learning of Q values and how that uh, evolved over time. There we used a very simple model in which we just used a single equation for the strengthening or weakening of the um, corticostriatal synapse. And so we sort of, collapse the two pathways into one, if you will. Uh, but in the more detailed account, for sure, and it's a very important part of uh, how medications work, why they work the way they work, and so on. Right, because dopamine tends to regulate the plasticity and the effect of the cortex at the neck of the cortical striatal junction, yeah? That's exactly right, yeah. yeah exactly. And, and, and it seems in opposite ways in the direct versus indirect pathway. Yeah. Um, Another question is, what are the circuits that might be interacting or interfering with dopamine secretion? Right, well, <laughs> so that, that's a very good question. So, so we, well, I mean, the circuits that, in, that modulate this, actually, if you have a chance to see, or if you haven't uh, seen the previous talk by Tony Grace, he has an excellent account of the circuits that modulate, for example, tonic versus phasic and how they're different. Uh, and, and it's a fairly complicated, but very, very elegant. It's actually not complicated. It's, ele it's an elegant story, and it turns out that the tonic versus phasic firing of neurons are driven by different neuron, by different uh, receiving structures, and so on. Uh, but um, I guess the the idea here is that if you have too much dopamine innervation, we really don't know what is going on. But imagine you just have too many dopamine terminals. It's a very simple account. But if you just have too many dopamine terminals, even the the regulation might be exactly the same. But you just have more terminals, sort of dumping more dopamine out, uh, and that would be enough to explain the whole thing, even if there was no preceding, no upstream um, effect driving that. Um, so, so, but we, we just don't know if that's the case. We need more detailed studies, including post-mortem studies, which have not been done uh, with, certainly with the level of detail that they should be. In particular, looking, for example, at the branching of axons in, in the striatum. Are really dopaminerans branching more uh, in, in the striatum in Tourette's? Um, we're a little over time, but I'm going to go to this one last uh, comment slash question. Great talk. Um, I'd like to know computational models of dopamine that have been developed at your lab. Oh, hold on, sorry. Again, I'd like to know, I'm trying to understand the question myself. I, it, great talk. Okay. I'd like to know computational models of dopamine that have been developed at your lab can be the basis of the development of new machine learning tools. <laughs> okay, so, so uh, great question. Uh, so, Yes and no, <laughs> uh, and let me explain what I mean by yes and no. So the models to a large extent, well, so, so there's some reasons to believe that the direct and indirect pathway are useful. It's useful, for example, to have these two pathways as opposed to a single pathway, uh, which is what you would do in machine learning. Uh, but for that, I, I would defer to the work of Michael Frank with Ann Collins. They have a nice psychological review article on this in which they try to look at, well, why would you have these two systems? What are the advantages of having these two systems? And, and the, that, that's really their work. Um, so the, the other part in which I did want to mention, and this gives me an opportunity to go back to something that I mentioned earlier, which is the linking between this theory, uh, this theoretically based computational psychiatry, which I tend to work on, and then the machine learning part. And the, 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 we have, we have uh, argued quite at length about this in, in an article with uh, Quentin Heiss and Michael Frank as well in Nature Neuroscience in, uh, two years ago, I think, or maybe three years ago by now, uh, in, in which the idea is that one of the big problems with the machine learning 
approach, as you will know, is that it requires massive amounts of data and it deals with uh, the curse of dimensionality. So you have very, very high dimensional data sets and so it's very difficult to, to, to deal with such high dimensional data sets. That's why you need huge, uh, very, very, very big data. And, and so the techniques that are used to do dimensionality reduction that you need to do to then have classifiers and so on and uh, things capable of predicting are usually completely a theoretical and statistical. So you can do all sorts of uh, ICAs or uh, you can do elastic nets that do uh, that have embedded the dimensionality reduction. You can do all sorts of things, but really it's not a guided intelligent uh, mechanistic basis of dimensionality reduction. And so what the computational models allow you to do, hopefully if they're good, is you can get at specific parameters of computational models that should represent things that are biologically more meaningful, that will represent things such as the extent to which dopamine is released or the extent, the, the, the size of the prediction errors and things of that sort. And if indeed from the mechanistic studies we think those are very relevant, it might be that then with those small numbers of parameters from the computational models rather than the raw data, which is, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of variables, you can run those computational models, extract some key parameters, and then the dimensionality reduction is done for you. You can apply a machine learning on the small set of parameters. And, and like I said, it, it's a long story. There's a couple of examples on, of this that have been published, one actually also from Michael Frank's lab. Uh, we, we're, we're working on one that we, we hope to, to submit relatively soon to, but uh, it's one of the ideas is using these models which have specific parameters that you can feed to data to do your dimensionality reduction and then do machine learning on top of those. Thank you very, very much. We are absolutely out of time, but it was exciting and a very interesting <laughs> talk. Um, thank, so thank you. Again, Dr. Maya. Um, we invite our thank attendees you. to join us again in an hour from now at 10 a.m. Pacific time, 1 p.m. Eastern time, as we continue the discussion of computational psychiatry with Dr. Gunter Schipig. He will be presenting Identifying Pattern Transitions of Mind and Brain in Psychotherapy, the Nonlinear Dynamics of Human Change Processes. I hope to see you there.